Well, good morning. We are so happy you can join us for this online life group Sunday school class. Today we start a new two-week study of the book Song of Solomon, or some call Song of Songs. We'll look at Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15 through chapter 3, verse 5. We're reminded that God created humans to be relational with the greatest relationship being between him and his people. Now let me remind you to share, like, or comment today on our class. Thank you again for joining us. Now, do you remember anything about your elementary days? What about that first crush that you had? Remember when you were in elementary school, you would pass notes to someone you liked? Think about the first time that you liked someone. You asked a friend to give that person a note that contained a question. Do you like me? Check yes or no. Kind of reminds me of a song. Then receive the response, and if it was yes, man, wow, what a day. You were excited. When we become adults, we realize that relationships are a little bit more complicated especially since we live in a culture that doesn't necessarily view relationships in the same ways that Christians should. Now this is why the last two sessions of our Living Wisely in a Foolish World study will take us to another Bible book that God led Solomon to write, the Song of Solomon. Now both sessions that we'll be studying these two weeks will focus on building healthy relationships. Now before we begin this morning, let's pray that God gives us wisdom and insight as we look into his word. And like we've been praying, let's pray that we take God's word and make it come alive in our lives for his glory and continue to pray for our country and wisdom for her leaders. Pray for that person in your life that does not have a relationship with God. So if you will, pause your device and take a moment to pray. Now Solomon's love poem tells the story about his romantic relationship with the woman who would become his wife. She's only mentioned once by the title Shulamite in the Song of Songs, uh, chapter 6, verse 13. Now we don't know much about her, so this could be her actual name, her married name, and it's the feminine form of the name Solomon, meaning peaceful one, or maybe the name of the area where she grew up. But what we do know is that she was Solomon's first and truest love, and this Bible book serves as a poetic chronicle of Solomon's romantic relationship with her. Now, because our healthy relationships matter to the Lord, we must become wise in how we invest in relationships. And our passage today gives us three actions for building healthy relationships, especially between a husband and a wife. So today, we have Kit Hintz, our campus pastor at our Southport location, Bill Tucker, our minister of military, we also have Tammy Kirkland, our Director of Preschool and Children's Ministry, to share with us about our passage today. And it's good to have them with us all today. So, Kit, tell us about what we see in chapter 2, verse 15. Song of Solomon 2, 15 says this, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in bloom. So, uh, I know some of you guys are listening to this, and you just call your wife and say, Hey, babe, come here, I knew it. I knew the key to a healthy relationship was to go hunting together, right? That's exactly what this means. No, no, it's not what that means. Uh, a lot of people over the years have struggled to interpret well uh, the Song of Solomon because it's poetry, it's wisdom literature. And so there's times where we do interpret it literally, and there's times where it, it's meant to be figurative. It's a poem. And, and that's kind of the case here in this text uh, where she's talking about being in a vineyard. She and Solomon were together. Uh, in the vineyard, walking around, looking at its beauty. Uh, it was in bloom, and uh, that reminded her of their relationship. And so uh, she's speaking about little foxes that were a real problem, little varmints, critters that would come in and eat the vine, that would eat the fruit, that would eat the roots, and, and destroy uh, the vineyard in different ways, sometimes uh, to the point where people weren't aware until they saw the destruction. And so uh, she sees this, and she's reminded of their relationship. And she says to Solomon, uh, you know, Solomon, in the same way, we want to care for, for our, our marriage, for our relationship. We want to catch the little foxes. Um, it reminds me when I first bought uh, my first house in Jacksonville. I had a good friend there called the HOA that would send me love letters, uh, letting me know how good or bad my vineyard or my lawn actually looked. And I remember trying to deal with the problems of it, and it finally hit me uh, that I needed to go to the, the most meticulous person that I knew who cared for their lawn well. And so I did, and they told me about this spray company. And it was a great thing because this spray company would come out and not only deal with things like chinch bugs and sod web worms and all these other issues, 
uh, but they would fertilize it for me and they knew when to do it and how to do it and how much to do it. And soon this yard that was a problem began to look beautiful uh, because I had an expert helping me care for it and, and we were doing things that would prevent problems as opposed to uh, responding to the problems as they came. I think in the same way, uh, we need to be able to do that in our relationships. And so I would just encourage you, uh, she says to watch for the little foxes. Uh, I think three things we need to watch for. Number one, we need to watch ourselves, right? We're sinful people, we lean towards sin. And so we need to be aware of areas of our life where we tend to respond sinfully and we need to pursue Christ. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to grow into the image of Christ and act more like him and think more like him and talk more like him. And so we wanna pursue Jesus well, because the reality is uh, the more godly we are, the better husband we're gonna be, the better father we're gonna be, the better wife, the better mother, right? The more godly we are. Uh, number two, I would say we need to watch, watch our relationships, watch our marriages, right? And we do that, number one, by being preventative uh, and being intentional about spending time together. The reality is life makes us forget. We forget why we love this person. We forget why we enjoyed being with this person. We get so busy uh, with the stressful requirements of life uh, that we forget to tend to this relationship. And so we need to be intentional about spending time together. Uh, but we also need to watch out for issues. The reality is we are sinful and so we're gonna have conflict. So how do we deal with that conflict, right? We need to be able to communicate well. We need to be able to listen well. We need to be able to believe the best in the other person. I think sometimes in marriage, somewhere along the way, we forget this person deeply loves us and cares about us and wants the best for us, just like we do. And so uh, we need to be able to listen well and really uh, pursue uh, resolution together. And the last thing, uh, we just gotta watch out for the world. The world doesn't want what's best for our marriage. In fact, there are many lies that it tells us that actually erode our marriage, that keep it from being the best that it can be. And so going back to that pursuit of godliness, that helps us to be more discerning about the things that will truly bless our marriage and the things that will tear it down. Thank you, Kit. Great job. Look at the wisdom we see from Solomon as we look at building trust. Bill, discuss with us about what we see in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 about trust. Do you remember your wedding vows? Of course, this is if you're married, but, um, you know, mine went something like this. Um, I, Bill, take April, who's my wife, uh, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Now I've been married for about 31 years, but it's always good to have a good reminder about some of the parts of this vow that I made when I married my wife. Uh, specifically, uh, as it relates to the passage I'm gonna talk about today, uh, their Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, uh, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Uh, but in the vows there, I said to have and to hold, and then also I said to love and to cherish. And uh, sometimes we focus more on the richer and poorer and, you know, good health and sickness and those types of things. But this idea of to have and to hold and to love and to cherish, very important when it comes to having a, a healthy uh, relationship with your spouse. Uh, and this section of, of Song of Sol Songs is uh, focusing on building trust in a relationship. Um, how do you build trust in your marital relationship? Um, there's various interpretations of the Song of Songs, and, uh, and they're trying to figure out, uh, these scholars, are, they're trying to figure out who the main characters are. And some would say, well, it's God and Israel that are reflected here. Others might say it's, uh, it's, it's Jesus and the church. Uh, but I think a simple, straightforward reading of it just kind of shows us that it's a, a man and a woman who are passionately engaged in uh, uh, essentially seeking each other's love. And uh, so we see uh, in John MacArthur's commentary, he spoke about it as being kind of a, a three-part play in uh, the Song of Songs, uh, kind of where we see the husband and wife, uh, or sorry, the, the man and woman uh, leaving in a sense, cleaving, and then finally, in a sense, weaving together their relationship. Um, in Psalms, or Song of Songs uh, 2, verse 16, this is what it says there. It says, my love is mine and I am his. And this is a woman speaking to or about her, her uh, 
potential husband here. Um, my love is mine and I am his. He feeds among the lilies. And this really just speaks of uh, a, a couple's dedicated love, monogamous uh, relationship. And it's a, it's a beautiful picture of how God intended things to be. Now our world has polluted the idea of marriage and, and Satan has done his, his job of uh, tearing down and tearing away at, at marriage relationships. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we've kind of lost that uh, original definition of what God had in mind for our relationship. But here we kind of see it highlighted as uh, kind of a, a monogamous, committed relationship and uh, kind of focused on nurturing and strengthening one another in, uh, in the relationship. Uh, kind of what you might call a mutual submission uh, also seen here, uh, where she says, I am his. This also kind of points to what Paul talks about in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 7, where he, uh, he's talking to a, a Corinthian culture that's saturated in sin specifically sexual sin. And uh, he's trying to highlight this idea that uh, a husband and a wife have, have kind of mutual authority, authority over each, each other's bodies. Um, now, in verse 17, the one that follows, kind of highlights the, the devotion that uh, folks would have for one another. Uh, it says, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn around, my love, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the divided mountains. So one interpre interpretation here uh, that scholars uh, point out is that it's a young woman inviting her new husband to enjoy her physically. Another interpretation would see it as a lonely young woman who is uh, aching for her fiancé to return to her uh, from tending the flocks uh, in the countryside. Uh, for me, it reminds me of when I was able to rejoin with my wife after being deployed for some time overseas. Um, but how do you build trust in a marriage? Uh, we can see from these two verses, really it comes down to being dedicated and then being devoted. And uh, a lot easier said than done, especially as you, as you go further and further into your marriage years. And uh, it's something you have to definitely work on. Uh, but I'd encourage you to stay focused on your spouse, uh, stay devoted to your spouse, and uh, of course, cherish and respect your spouse. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate those words. Tammy, share with us about that final part of our scripture that is found in verse 1 through 5 of chapter 3. In my bed at night, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. I will arise now and go about the city through the streets and the plaza. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. The guards who go about the city found me. I asked them, have you seen the one I love? I just passed them when I found the one I love. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house, to the chamber of the one who conceived me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the wild does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until appropriate time. The woman continues to speak in these verses. She expressed her longing to be with her future husband. And in doing so, she included a reminder that one must be careful to avoid intimate temptations outside of the marriage relationship. These verses are highly symbolic language and they address the restraint and control needed in order to maintain one's sexual purity. These verses tell a story of the woman and it also shows that she's searching for the one that she loves, but she's unable to find him. Again, she referred to him as the one she loves. We can look in chapter two and verse 17 and see that she was devoted to him exclusively and she was eager to be with him. When she found herself in a situation where she needed to make an important decision, she didn't want to be foolish, but she didn't want to lose him again either. So she decided she would never let him go away from her. Not having, in him, not having him in her life would not be an option, but pay close attention to the fact that she took him into her mother's room, quite the opposite of what you might imagine she would do she took him to the room in her mother's house where she was born. By bringing him there instead of to her room, she shows that she was determined to practice restraint. She was not going to give in to her eagerness to be intimate with him. That kind of intimacy, it's reserved for our marriages. The pursuit of the bride for her soon-to-be husband, it's very noble. We see here by her example 
that her desires for him would only come after their marriage commitment. Avoiding temptation means that your attention will be directed exclusively towards your marriage part partner. Avoiding temptation means that your attention will be directed exclusively towards your marriage partner, and those same desires must not be fulfilled until the marriage has taken place. God wants us to honor him in every aspect of our lives. When we disregard the model for a healthy relationship that Christ gives us in his word, we're definitely setting ourselves up for an unhealthy relationship. The Bible is a roadmap with instructions in regards to every area of our lives, and that also includes our dating life and our marriage life. Thanks, Tammy. As we come to a close, I want you to consider these actions. On a scale of one to five, with one being little attention and five being a lot of attention, evaluate your relationship with your spouse, if you're married, and your relationship with Christ. Yes, so you can know we all have room to strengthen our relationships, don't we? So think about two actions you could take to strengthen your marriage relationship if you're married and your relationship with Christ. I want to remind you that your staff is praying for you. And we love you and we thank God that he allows us to minister here at Highland Park Baptist Church with you. But please let us know if we can pray for you. Now if you need any questions, if you have any questions or need to speak with someone, please call 850-785-6530. We have staff members there who would love to speak with you. But if you're unable to connect by phone, or if you would like a study guide, email me at cfondren at highlandpark.org. Now remember, we will start a new study in two weeks in Isaiah. You will need a new book, so pick up a book at the church, or email, and one will be sent to you. Now remember, today's worship services are at 9 o'clock and 10.30, so come and join us. And our online services begin at 9 o'clock this morning. I want to thank you again for joining us for our online Life Group Sunday School class. God bless each of you. Enjoy this week in the Lord.